I'm just going to start recording in progress. Okay. Um, so um, welcome everybody to the July 21 meeting of Didi Plaza UK. And uh, Bill, I want to welcome you again uh, for joining us. We're delighted to have you here all the way from the West Coast uh, of the United States, where it is around about the eight o'clock in the morning mark. So I'm glad we could move it for you. So at least it's a little bit later. For you. I appreciate it. Yeah, <laughs> you, you got me conscious as opposed to semi. <laughs> <laughs> so we really appreciate you taking the time to, to join us. So um, very briefly, Bill is a civil rights attorney in the San Francisco Bay Area and is on the board of directors of the Mary Ferrell Foundation. Um, he wrote a preface to the Gary Hill book, The Other Oswald, A Wilderness of Mirrors. And it's there that you mentioned, Bill, um, specifically the defector program and Project Longstride, where another defector, similar in appearance to Oswald, Robert Webster, who defected literally two weeks just before Oswald did. So today we're gonna to be looking at uh, discussing Lee Harvey Oswald's defection and just looking at what kind of defector actually was he. And the way we're gonna do this is, we're gonna run it in like a 20 minute section. So uh, I'm gonna pass over to Bill where he will give us a conversation about, about, the, about Oswald and the, his defection. Um, and then we'll pause and when, when you're ready, Bill, you just pause and then if you have any questions, we can take them then. But in the meantime, if you do have any questions, pop them in the chat area. I will make sure that I get that they get passed on to Bill and feel free to ask him um, whatever you like. So without any further ado, Bill, um, again, huge thank you for joining us, and I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Uh, I will uh, begin, I think, by offering a, a little bit of a teaser as to what I think uh, occurred uh, on the uh, Oswald end back in uh, the United States. Uh, in other words, why he came and why uh, and who was monitoring him at that point. My hunch is that it was uh, Office of Naval Intelligence and the uh, little outfit called SY, which is a security intelligence operation out of State Department. And, and the reasons I think this are a few things. One is that there was, in fact, an ONI uh, program uh, that, that's uh, was mentioned by Victor Marchetti back in uh, the 70s. And Marchetti uh, felt it operated out of New North Carolina. And he said it was run by Owen. Uh, another indicator is uh, a fella who testified to the ARB named Donald Monier. And he talked about a program called Navy Code 30, which was similar to the operation that Marchetti mentioned. And finally, I think a lot of us are aware that Oswald uh, called somebody in North Carolina named John Hurt. Uh, and uh, after he was arrested in uh, Dallas. And uh, there's indications, at least, this fellow was also counterintelligence and uh, was based in North Carolina and that he confessed to his wife after, shortly before he died. So, so it's a corroborated story to a limited extent, it's not yet the story I would take to the bank. Uh, so uh, I, I wanted to give you those caveats. And I wanted you to know that I did a rewrite of my 12 who built the Oswald legend last year. And uh, I'm gonna be leaning a lot on part three of this story uh, as, as I talk about it. But the other thing I wanted to talk about in this defector context is some new research uh, that I've got uh, and it's about a fellow named Kent Biffle. And uh, Biffle's important because he was writing for the Fort Worth Papers in 1959. He's out there talking to the family, the Oswald family, in the, in the days after Oswald defects. And then he plays a very important role on the day of the assassination where he literally fights his way into the motorcade and uh, with several other uh, reporters uh, who are local, and then uh, manages to get himself inside the book depository as the only reporter outside of Tom Allier, who you may remember, he did the filming of the rifle and all inside uh, the book depository. 
that day. So Biffle plays a very important role in both periods. In fact, uh, he wrote an article in November 1st, 1959, uh, and it's called Fort Werther May Become Russian So He Can Write About the Experience. And he's got uh, Robert Oswald interviewed there. And then uh, he uh, uh, winds up calling Oswald on the telephone two weeks later uh, on the 16th of November. And there's a Fort Worth story written on that day and it's called Turncoat Hangs Up on Mother. And the reason it has that title is because Marguerite Oswald was listening on the other line. And when Biffle actually gets through to Oswald, they start talking, he, Marguerite pipes in and he immediately hangs up. And what's strange about uh, this Biffle era, if you will, is not only does he continue to get stories from uh, Marguerite and from Robert, uh, which isn't so strange in itself. But what is strange is that Velma Marlin, who was the cashier at the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, uh, is now by April 6th of 1960, she's fielding Marguerite's phone calls and mail. If you called Marguerite's phone number, it got redirected to Velma Marlin. And uh, she worked with the D Dallas Deputy deputy superintendent and males on this. And this is a very critical time. I think a lot of you may remember, Marguerite's not getting all of Oswald's mail. And then uh, not only that, but she's becoming the representative of Oswald uh, it, with the Marines who are trying to take away his uh, honorable discharge and downgrade it to a, a less an honorable discharge, which of course would have a profound impact on his finance. And that's kind of where I'm leading this here, uh, is that uh, Oswald, when he got, gets to Mexico, gets to the Soviet Union, I should say, he, he engages in some very odd uh, tactics. He voluntarily states to the Soviets, that uh, if he becomes a Soviet citizen, he will make known to them such information concerning the Marine Corps and his specialty as he possessed. He intimated he might know something of special interest. As a radar operator, his specialty was aviation electronics. And it's finally come through to me that I think the reason he was good at aviation electronics was because Marguerite's husband, who was his father figure between ages eight and 11, was an electronics expert, Edwin Ekdahl. And uh, this guy Ekdahl uh, was uh, a, a, not only a father figure to Oswald, but uh, a, a, an electronics pro. And this is how Oswald got good at radar and a bunch of other related specialties uh, regard, around electronics. And uh, what's so interesting to me, of course, is that as an attorney, I keep looking back at the divorce that happened when Oswald's about nine or 10. And the attorney who represents Ekdahl is Fred Korth, who's the uh, Secretary of the Navy. And, uh, and so, you know, for a long time, I really had the opinion that Fred Korth was like the grand maneuver in this whole case. but. What's curious is that uh, Korth's uh, predecessor, Secretary of the Navy, was John Connolly, the governor who was, of course, in the car and shot along with Kennedy that day. And uh, so I'm of the opinion at this point uh, that there's a real possibility that somewhere, you know, in 1963, jumping forward for a moment, all this history was used as a possible uh, story to explain Oswald's motivation. Uh, I mean, Scotty Reston, who was a famous reporter for the New York Times when I was a kid, his son wrote a whole book about Oswald and believing that Oswald was shooting at Connolly. I don't think that was the case at all, because I don't think Oswald shot anybody. But even if he, but no matter what you think on that subject, I think that the more important thing to think about 
is that this whole Oswald Connolly story is a bit of a canard. In fact, it's total canard. Uh, even it was one of the stories they couldn't even get Marina to swallow. Uh, when Oswald was uh, in his first days as a uh, defector in the Soviet Union, uh, the legal attache wrote that Oswald has offered to furnish the Soviets with what he knows on US radar. And then uh, the, the counterintelligence guy from ONI says that he's got no record of a security clearance, but he might have access to confidential information. My point here is that this is really very muted language. This guy is sounding like not only a defector, but a traitor. Why are they treating him with kid gloves? It doesn't seem like they're terribly concerned about the security implications of his defection at all. Uh, nobody, and I, I ought to point out, that nobody quoted him as saying that he would provide classified information. And it's probably because he didn't actually say those words. What he might have said was something about, I know about radar, that kind of thing. And I might know something that you might want to know. But he really is toeing the line about not giving away secrets that could uh, get him in jail or prison, Assange style or work. Uh, Snyder, uh, the consul and former CIA guy who was interviewing him, uh, stated after the assassination, I believe he did not claim to possess knowledge or information of a highly classified nature. And the Warren Commission concluded that since neither the FBI or the Navy prosecuted Oswald, the State Department had no basis to conclude that Oswald's statement was anything more than rash talk. So what I think happened here is when Oswald meets Snyder at the American Embassy uh, in those days, right after he got into the Soviet Union, that he was coached to say uh, something that was a disloyal act, granted, that involved military information to the Soviet, but not of a classified nature, more along the same lines as Robert Webster. Uh, Robert Webster uh, was a fellow who uh, is the subject of the, Gary Hill's book, The Other Oswald. He had defected a couple weeks earlier. His uh, uh, specialty was fiberglass, and rockets uh, and fiberglass went together like ham and eggs in that era and probably now. And so they wanted to know through uh, Webster, Soviets did, uh, uh, what he had on rockets and the Americans in the Air Force who kind of guided his way. On their hand, they wanted to know whether uh, the Soviets were ahead of us or behind in rocketry. And by the time Webster was done, the conclusion was we were ahead by about a dozen. Uh, I think Oswald was a uh, work was a little bit more about adventure. You know, he knew a little bit more about electronics than a lot of people, uh, but he didn't have any big secrets to give up. Uh, just like Webster didn't have any big secrets to give up either, but he was a good observer. And that's what Oswald, he was an observer, in my opinion. Uh, Oswald told Snyder that he was gonna tell the Soviets what he knew about his specialty, aviation electronics. And as a result of his actions, the U.S. could find out counterintelligence information literally from the questions that the Soviets would be asking Oswald. Counterintelligence information on the Soviet Union was the kind of thing that military intelligence could never get enough of. And ONI was the most likely agency, I think, to handle Oswald in this setting. He was a Marine, so Marines were technically under the aegis of the ONI. Uh, Webster had been coaxed to defect by means of an attractive woman used by the Soviets as a honey trap. Uh, and uh, I, Oswald, I think, uh, you, you could call Marina a honey trap down the line. But, uh, I, I think it was more like at least those first uh, 18 months. He received a few favors and some coaching but I think he was largely operating on his own agenda. Larry Hancock put it really well. Uh, he, he believes that Oswald was used as a probe 
basically a test to see how the Soviets would respond to him. Sort of like a scientific mission in a way. An instrument pack to help launch him and see what happens. Oswald had a good IQ and he, under, and he, and he could speak Russian. Uh, so he was an asset. And that's the way I always think about it. But I don't think he's a, a he's very guided in terms of the, his ability as a pro. Um, so where I want to take it here is why he got the protection from the American embassy. And, and then I want to focus on uh, how he got backdoored by the Marines. Uh, so let's look at it this way. Uh, when Oswald meets Snyder, He's kind of teetering on a tightrope when he threatened to renounce his U.S. citizen. He went right up to the edge of losing his citizenship, but he didn't lose it like Robert Webster did. When Webster came back, he was a he was uh, admitted back in the country as an alien. He was no no longer a U.S. citizen. Although the results were different, I think both men were coached by intelligence operatives prior to their defection. I think the so coaching was relatively subtle, egging them on to do what they already wanted to do. Webster wanted romance. Oswald wanted adventure. Webster got burned by his military handlers. He lost his citizenship, and it took him years to get it back. Oswald got burned, too, but in a different way. And it's about, it's moving towards this problem with Connolly that I mentioned. Um, Snyder and the State Department went to an elaborate lengths not to accept Oswald's attempt to renounce his citizenship. On the other hand, the military went to great lengths to characterize his actions as a renunciation of his citizenship. The ensuing paper war between these two citizens engulfed still more agencies and prodded everyone to throw up their hands in trying to understand this battle. Uh, I'm still looking over this landscape uh, because I find it completely fascinating. And here's the reason why. Uh, Peter Dale Scott told me that he believes that ultra-right elements of the military were continuing their long battle with what I would describe as the effete liberals of the State Department. This is a fight that had been going on since World War II. We used to fight in America about who lost China, and the, the right wing really was furious at the left. Uh, Truman did not consider trying to hold on to the Chiang Kai-shek government in China is a priority. And, uh, it went towards Mao. And it really helped. That was one of the things that really helped kick off the culture war that plagues the U.S. to this day. Uh, Peter had a funny anecdote. Uh, he would, uh, he, he does liken the ultra-right elements of the military with uh, the National Association of Manufacturers over here. And he refers to that as the cowboy side of American culture. And the State Department, he refers to as kind of analogous to the Trilateral Commission, if you will, on the Yankee side. And I've always liked the Yankee Cowboy War as a metaphor of American culture in general. Uh, now, to be fair, I don't think this fight between the State Department and the military about whether Oswald should lose his citizenship was totally contrived by intelligence operatives on of both agents. But I think I line up with Peter on this one. Uh, in the middle of this paper war, and in the middle of 1960, you've probably seen uh, what's a famous uh, memo that Hoover wrote, to the Office of Security of the State Department. This is the one that said that, you know, Oswald Dean impersonated. And uh, I could send it to you, Tony or somebody if you'd like to see it and put it online. Uh, uh, the, the Office of Security was actually a very tiny division, only had about 12 people, and it was known as SY. If you all know Otto Atepka, he was one of the officers in SY. Uh, Hoover was concerned that an imposter was using Oswald's birth certificate. And I think this is so powerful for us in the research community. I think we've been kind of blinded to the other aspects of this memo. And the reason I say that is because only one other agency is copied on this memo, not the CIA, uh, not other intelligence agencies, but ONI. So it's between 
Hoover to uh, the State Department uh, intelligence. And ONI gets copied. So, who, who, you know, what Hoover is saying in this letter, as I read it, is this is an ONISY affair. It's not an affair of the CIA. I, I'm not saying the CIA had absolutely no knowledge of Oswald, but I don't think they're the driving force. Um, and not Air, Air Force intelligence isn't brought up, Marine intelligence isn't brought up. Just ONI and just State Department intelligence. Uh, it seems to me a Hoover knew something about who had an interest in Oswald, uh, information that we don't have. When ONI reported the defection of Oswald, and the copy that hit the file has SY all over it, that's the Office of Security within the State Department again. I always assumed that the State Department was deeply troubled by Oswald's defection. But now I wonder if ONI and SY, despite all the carping back and forth, were in harmony. Were they in, into dangling Oswald together and then creating this paper war about the renunciation of the citizenship that engulfs everybody in this whole uh, drama, which I think, you know, uh, I'm a big mole hunter, I like Jim Angleton, because I think uh, for a lot of these agencies, the whole idea was to try to smoke out, was there a Soviet mole in their midst? And I'm quite convinced that a lot of the nonsense around Lee Harvey Oswald, renunciation business, and then later referring to him as Lee Henry Oswald in the file, it's all designed to try to smoke out who has information they shouldn't have, which is the classic way of finding out who the mole is. So in any case, all this goes on right in the middle of Oswald's time in the Soviet Union, the time where he can't uh, really explain uh, his circumstances to U.S. military officers and couldn't really receive, readily receive any mail. For whatever reason, he's not in communication with his family from late 59 to early 61. Marguerite says she writes him three letters. All of them are undelivered. Oswald, let me just wrap this one little piece up and then I'll breath here. Oswald didn't reappear until Marguerite personally left home to go to the State Department on January 21st, 1961. That's the day after JFK's inauguration. When Marguerite gets to D.C. in the State Department, she gets a red carpet treatment. Uh, you know, Rusk makes a point of sending one of his main people down there to have coffee with her and tell her that, well, we've got uh, we know where he is, and you're going to be hearing from him real soon. And sure enough, she does. And uh, uh, she gets Oswald's address from the State Department. And Oswald, uh, uh, at the same time, says he has now turned to the State Department and says, I want to return to the USA. So I want to wrap up this section, if I can go a few extra minutes. Is that all right, Tony? Absolutely fine, Bill. Keep going. Okay. I wanted to, because this, I think, will kind of tie together the question I have about Biffle and the question I have about uh, the Soviet Union. Um, what I'm asking people to do is, uh, if you've got your computers open, uh, go to my chapter three and go to the section called How the Marine Brass uh, Backdoored Oswald. And when I say my chapter three, uh, if you're interested, you can find it on uh, Mary Farrell. If you go to the home page and just click on the, the top uh, uh, ab about of uh, the current events, uh, it'll take you to my essay. It's called uh, The Twelve Who Built the Oswald Legend, and you can drop down to how the Marine Brass deck backdoor at Oswald. And the only reason I suggest that is because I'm going to be kind of reading from it verbatim for a few couple minutes. And there's some great documents here that I think will make more sense if you're able to actually look at them rather than hear me describe it. Um, but with that said, let me uh, plunge on. Because uh, uh, what I'm asking you all to do is take a look at how the Marine Brass at this little naval air station out in Illinois called the Glenview Naval Air Station, damaged Oswald's future while he's incommunicado during 1960. 
Uh, what we see here is what I describe as the plumage of a truly rare bird, an exposed intelligence operation. And no matter where you stand on Oswald handling the gun or this or that, he's caught up in something here. And uh, I don't think anybody on any side can deny it. Uh, Peter Dale Scott figured much of this out years ago. It's in chapter four of his book, Dallas 63. I helped edit. Uh, I forgot most of these details, believe it or not, and I had to labor it with what I thought was my own totally independent conclusions. And then I realized, you know, like Peter, once again, had covered much, much of this ground and I had even gone over it myself and forgotten about it. Um, my conclusions are a bit different than his, but all of it's fascinating to me. So you may remember that the Albert Schweitzer College out in Switzerland uh, in March of 1960, was trying to reach Oswald to confirm that he was going to be beginning his classes in Switzerland during the following month. It's addressed to Oswald's address in the Marine Corps out in California. But the problem is he'd been discharged from the service since September 59. And of course, he's in the Soviet Union and has been for the last five, six months. So Marguerite received his notice from the college and she gets it thanks to a string of forwarding addresses that were on file at the Fort Worth Fort Post Office. So you hear all these different addresses, you know, uh, one on Fifth Street, another one on Fifth Street, another one on Harley, and another one on Eighth Avenue. Uh, and she'd been moving continuously during this period since Oswald moved out of her, uh, left her place after staying for the weekend in September 59 and getting on that freighter to uh, Europe. Um, so my point here is that one of the addresses is Harley. And we're gonna see this Harley address uh, in a predominant fashion in the next few weeks. Because now I'm moving up to April of 1960. And the commander at the Naval Air Station uh, uh, says sends, sends uh, to Oswald a notice that they're gonna have a board of officers convening to determine his fitness for retention in the reserve because of his recent activities. He's not doing his reserve duties, you know? And, and, and they're justified in not being happy with this man. I mean, it's one thing to be in the, a defector to the Soviet Union, but the other piece that people actually forget is that he had, he was supposed to be in Illinois. He was supposed to show up and, you know, do his due diligence and he hadn't done it. So he's looking at a set undesirable discharge. Uh, so the notice said he had the right to present evidence and to appear by person or be represented by counsel. Uh, and he was given a deadline you know, in June and it's mailed to him at the Harley address. It's mailed by certified mail. It's the form for him to fill out and return is enclosed. It portrays his address as 36, 13 Harley, and this is a real former address for Marguerite. So now, if it's really weird, uh, it, it, but if you look at the envelope, the Warren Commission all of a sudden gets very hazy, and they report that the envelope's too faint to photocopy, but if you look at it, it doesn't say Harley, it says Hurley, H-U-R-L-E-Y. That's a non-existent address. If you try to type 3613 Hurley, Fort Worth, Texas, into your browser on your phone, uh, you're going to come up with Harley Street, not Hurley. So it seems that uh, you could chalk this off as an innocent mistake or uh, a typo or this or that. It, but uh, here's the problem. Uh, Marguerite gets this notice somehow and, and writes a response to it. As the deadline approaches, she responds to the uh, April notice in, in June, and she says, inform me of the basis for the proceedings, and, and I need to stay for the hearing because I got no contact with them. That's why I went through this business about the mail. She, there was simply no communication in 1960. Uh, between the Oswalds until January 61. She added that after hearing from you, I will be willing to act on his behalf. So Marguerite's Marine contact 
uh, decides, as I say, to have his cake and eat it too. He won't stay the proceeding, and they won't, and they failed to let her act on his behalf. Uh, she needed counsel and didn't get one. Instead, what happens is this. She receives a second response from Letch, from this lieutenant saying, uh, we got to take action because of his request for Soviet citizenship. In view, he has to inform the headquarters and he's out of the country without permission. It's considered that a letter sent to the last address on file is sufficient notification. A letter will be sent by certified mail informing your son of the convening date of the board. And uh, so no, here's the important thing to note. Even though Marguerite said, I'll act on his behalf, they don't send it. She had sent them a new address, which is actually, and you'll laugh, uh, uh, the Hurley, a Hurley address. This is 1410 Hurley, but uh, it doesn't go up as high as the other number I mentioned. And uh, it, it, and even though she tells them about the Hurley address, they don't send the notice there. They send it to the last address on file, 3613 Hurley, a place where the board should have known at this point that no one lived. Uh, and uh, the, the certified mail envelope is addressed to Lee H. Oswald, 3613 Hurley, Fort Worth, and it's marked certified. And then... What's weird is, is I've got it in the document, if you get a chance to look at it. The envelope that, uh, with the arrive, that is sent with the arrival notice uh, is actually addressed to 1410 Hurley. Uh, so what we have here is a mail uh, arrival address that's typically provided by the sender. The sender can write any address desired and simply stick the arrival notice in the mail. So some, you, you, so you look at the envelope and the envelope is addressed to the non-existent 3613 Hurley address, but the, the uh, certified mail slip states the current 1410 Hurley address. So they tried to pretend that it was sent to 1410 Hurley when it was actually sent to 3613 Hurley, which again doesn't exist. So as a result, Marguerite didn't get the notice for the hearing. This is, I've seen this kind of stunt before. I'm an attorney, I do rent control hearings and you know, landlords who are trying to undercut their tenants uh, are fre frequently will engage in what the lawyers call sewer service. This is a perfect example of sewer service. Um, as Marguerite told the Warren Commission, after corresponding with me as Mar Mrs. Marguerite Oswald, they sent the dishonorable discharge hearing notice in Lee's name, addressee only, when they knew he was out of the country. But she didn't spell out what I just spelled out. Uh, and and it, it seems like, uh, it's, it, you know, it's certainly fair to say that they weren't prepping him as a patsy in a future presidential murder. But they were trying to dirty this guy up. So now he would be at their mercy, if you will, do what they wanted him to do. Uh, Peter Dale Scott's analysis, I think, is useful here. Uh, what we know of the sociology of ONI and Marine uh, G2, which is Marine Intelligence, corroborates their sympathy to the hunt of subversives in government. The Glenview Naval Air Station the site of Marine G2 Regional Detachment, where we found documents addressed, had been for years a center for right-wing political activity. In the 1930s, the Ninth Naval District had organized reserve intelligence teams to ferret out intelligence on <laughs> radicals and pacifists. In 1960, while they shuffled their Oswald records, they played host to a five-day school of the Christian anti-communist crusade. It should be known that they were not an ad hoc group, this Christian crusade, but an international organization that worked with the World Anti-Communist League, and then later the National Endowment for Democracy, which is kind of you know, the above ground equivalent of the CIA here in America. Indeed, the Glenview Naval Air Station was lending respectability to the crusade that sustained onslaught against another part of the government, the accommodators in the U.S. State Department. So what all this means is when Oswald came home in 62, he had to lie on all of his employment forms to get any kind of job. 
He couldn't get a clearance to work in a security facility. He couldn't work in aviation electronics on the military side, and he couldn't get decent benefits under the GI Bill. On top of that, he's compromised. If someone in government wants a little help from him, he'll probably be forced to do their bidding with the hopes of getting his discharge upgraded down the line. When Oswald protested this hearing and asked for a discharge review, the decision went all the way to the desk of the Secretary of the Navy. Oswald got no relief. And as we'll see, uh, John Connolly was actually the guy uh, that I believe uh, did administer Oswald's uh, request for an upgrade. And uh, he simply refused to do it. He took a hard look at it, and there's a fascinating memo uh, where uh, Connolly uh, took a hard look at it, and his attache took a hard look at it as he was turning his papers over to Fred Korth and said, no, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do much anything. I'm just going to kick it back to the Marines. And the Marines kicked it back and said, you're not getting your upgrade. So Korth never got to see it. Uh, Fred Korth, Secretary of the Navy, who had represented Oswald's uh, stepfather. And I keep wondering at the end of the day, whether, uh, especially in July 1963, where they tried to kick it one more time to Fred Korth and it still didn't get to him, whether in fact there wasn't some work done to keep this Connolly legend alive and to keep Korth away. Because Korth might have actually shown some mercy. To us. Uh, that's the most surprising possibility that I've gone from this. I could talk more about it. It's in my. It's in that chapter, but that covers the high notes. I think of the drama of Oswald's infection that have not been, you know, thoroughly mulled over. I don't think by the uh, community. Uh, a lot of us have looked at this. Asked, but I don't think people have really looked at how the renunciation business got snowballed into a, a, a mole hunt uh, and also how this business of Oswald's uh, discharge got used to basically yoke him, if you will, as someone who would have to do the bidding of his betters and in intelligence basically for the rest of his life. And uh, I think it goes to a lot of his motivation. I can talk a little bit more about that uh, in a, if you give me a few more minutes later on. But this is where I'd like to break for now and take some. That's great, Bill. Thanks a lot for that. We do have some um, interesting conversations going on in the chat area. Um, I'm gonna start with uh, Johnny. Johnny Cairns, you've got a, a question uh, specifically about, um, uh, if you wanna just come in, Johnny, unmute yourself. And um, there's a question you've got about the, about post office boxes in Dallas and how easy it would be to get those. Um, do you want to come in, Johnny? Yeah, sure, Bill. How you doing? Good, Johnny. Good. Yeah, good to see you. It's good to see you. I've um, got a quick question. I'm, uh, I'm currently yeah, I'm co-authoring a book that's coming out in November. I'm putting the finishing touches on it just now. And one of the um, many aspects of the case I'm looking at is the mail transaction for the, the alleged murder weapon. We've all heard about, you know, the, the serious uh, discrepancies with the postal regulations, etc. But one of the things I have been looking at is um, the why would Oswald order the, the rifle to his own PO box if he used an alias? Now, I was talking to Barry Ernest about this, uh, and I was trying to get a hold of how much money Oswald was making back in, like, October and March 1962-63. And then the Warren report, it has a list of his expenses. And it shows like all the surplus money that he allegedly had each month. Um, my question is, how easy was it to um, rent a post office box in March in, uh, in 1962, 63? Um, the reason that I ask it is because if it was easy to acquire one, then why didn't Oswald take out a separate PO box in the name of Hadell, order the weapons to that box, and once he had the weapons, close it down, and there'd be no link to himself. I think you'd have to show ID, and uh, so uh, I think that's all it would take. Oswald was certainly capable of creating 
could ID if he wanted to. Of course, the Hidel ID was exactly the kind of ID that would have been rejected, <laughs> which is a kind of another discussion. So uh, I, the answer to, in my mind is no, it wouldn't have been hard, and he chose not to do it. Mm. It's because in, in the Armstrong's book, it says Dallas Postal Inspector Ralph W. Thomas said that no references or identification was required for a person or persons to rent a post office box. So I've asked Armstrong about this and they never went back to me. So I'm trying to confirm it. Yeah, but I can't confirm it for you, but uh, that, that doesn't seem unreasonable. Mm. Uh, it's not, it, it's not, you know, the, the way it would be done now. But, you know, uh, I, I, it doesn't seem unreasonable. That's about as much I can put, as I can put on. I'm not an authority on or, uh, regulations as well as uh, how they uh, chose to or not chose to enforce them. What I can say, Johnny, is, uh, as you know, I've researched this in depth as well. Uh, the, that's how I got involved in the case, was researching the postal uh, I hope you get a chance to come to America at some point and look at the postal stuff at the archives, because frankly, I don't think there's any other way to understand it uh, as well as you might, because you can't get access to enough documents via the mail to really do you much good. Yeah, it's, it, it's very frustrating. But the bottom line is, I think you're on the right track in focusing on that point, it's one of the weakest parts of the case. Because yeah. surely, I mean, let's take, let's just say for argument's sake, the Moran report's correct, okay? Oswald right. is an assassin. He must know that when he leaves that rifle behind on the sixth floor, that it's going to be traced to him anyway. Well, just like James Earl Ray leaving his rifle at the scene of the crime, yeah. you know, wrapped up in a blanket after the death of Martin Luther King. There's The rifle business is the biggest nonsense in my opinion in this case and, and that's why when i got involved in this case that was the first place i went yeah i agree that's, i think it's nonsense as well plus i was going to say the um you know if why if he wants to remain anonymous or why orders anything through the mail when he can just walk into any gun shop pay yeah. cash and yeah yeah that's always been the problem right i mean it's kind of like a calling card uh or an well, stick a massive sign <laughs> on your head saying, yeah, I know what I bought. Yeah, I mean, this is the <laughs> most well-documented rifle in Dallas, and it's left on the sixth floor. <laughs> yeah. um, Stuart, so you've got a question. Do you want to come in here? Uh, yeah, just a, a, a quick one, uh, Bill. Um, thank you very much for your talk so far. Um, do you believe that any information that might have been provided by Oswald to the Russians uh, led to the downing of Gary Powers, U2? No, I don't believe that. I've agonized over that for years. And I think that was the import, was uh, to make it look like he might have been involved in that. And, you know, he, he never said the word U2. He went right up to the line. He had worked on the U2, as most of you probably know. But I, I don't think that uh, he, frankly, that he had enough information to give anybody about anything. You know, he, he sat in the radar bubble. So he knew a little something. And that was about it. But I think the, the notion was to make it look like he had something to offer. Uh, I'm, I'm suspicious enough in my old age to think that Alan Bellis set up that whole U2 downing in May of 1960. And what always killed me was the, you know, Oswald got serious with the State Department in January 61, as I mentioned, but it was the days after the U2 where he first turned to his uh, uh, colleague, Alexander Zeiger, who was his boss at his job and said, I wanna go. And I think it was because the U2 meant that in a sense, his job was done. At least he knew that he was not going to be a major player of any kind. And things had moved out of, mm. into a larger realm. And he was always a small. Yeah. Okay, Bill. Thanks for that. Yeah. Thanks, Bill. Do you want to continue? I, thought, I haven't got any other questions that I can see unless anybody wants to jump in. All right. Let me turn then 
to uh, uh, this business about Biffle because uh, I think that this is, uh, frankly, uh, my current area, one of my current areas of exploration. And uh, so I wanted you to know that uh, I not only do I think this is an exciting story, but I think this is the kind of story that makes the work that all of us are doing so much so relevant even today in 2021. There's big pieces of the story that I think we can still put together. And the Biffle story is one of them. And let me explain why. Uh, Biffle was writing stories about Oswald in 1960 during this very period I was mentioning. And uh, you know, it's not surprising when you think about it that you know the mail people and the phone people were willing to work with Biffle and willing to work on Oswald because after all, Oswald's a defector. A defector is a big deal. There's no two ways about it in intelligence service. And the only thing that's a bigger deal is when the, uh, the defector comes home, because now you've got access to all of the defector's information. So Biffle is a character. He was, uh, was originally working with this smaller paper called the Fort Worth Press. And then he gradually started working with the Fort Worth Star-Telegram. Now, the Fort Worth Star-Telegram is really kind of a story in itself I want to use as a little color for background because it, it, it's crucial. Uh, a fellow named uh, Amos, Eamon Carter was the founder of the paper. And his son uh, became the founder of the paper after Eamon died in the 60s and uh, was the editor uh, through the 78 or, no, even later, into the 80s. So Eamon Carter, uh, father and son, are, are characterized by Peter Dale Scott in L63 as pillars of the Air Force industrial complex. Uh, Eamon Carter became publisher of the Star-Telegram in 20, 1923. And it's been said that uh, no other individuals in no other city in the United States are so entwined with each other as Eamon Carter and Fort Worth. Uh, you know, it, it, People have described Fort Worth as practically a one-man city. Fort Worth is the area that's always forgotten in this case, and I don't think it should be because it is twin city to Dallas. Uh, Marguerite told the Warren Commission as a practical nurse, she took care of the children of Eamon Carter Jr. in his home. Uh, in 1949, Lee went to Cat Camp Eamon Carter Summer Camp. It's a 340-acre facility sponsored by the YMCA. Eamon Jr. was held as a POW by the Germans and risked his life in espionage and sending contraband in the mail that could have gotten him killed. He continued to smuggle contraband to his friends in communist-held Poland, clothing, necessities, luxury items, and money until his death in 1982. And it, it's important to keep in mind here that you know when Oswald is hiding out in Minsk, if you will, uh, and, meets Margar and meets Marina and all that, Minsk is Bielorussia. It's the same basic region as Poland. In fact, when Marina met him, he thought he, you know, she thought his Russian had a Polish accent, which I think it did. Uh, and uh, what's interesting to me is that, you know, Eamon Carter Jr. is running the paper in 79 when the HSCA comes out with its uh, findings. And, and the HSCA, as you probably recall, it came out with a conspiracy fund. And after they did this, the Star Telegram, which is, you know, a rah-rah, you know, red, white, and blue kind of outfit, they went all out pu pushing the conspiracy angle. It was like the paper had finally figured out it had been used all these years. Now, besides Eamon Carter Jr., Marguerite, you know, uh, took care of his kids, I think, until literally days before the assassination like early November, 1960. Uh, uh, Marguerite knew other people with influence, and one of them was the reporter, Kent Biffle. Now, I mentioned all the articles that Biffle had written in 59. Uh, now I want to take it a little bit uh, closer. Uh, Biffle, uh, in 1961, after Oswald comes home, uh, no, before Oswald comes home, 
he's listed as an FBI informant. He was reporting on a longtime criminal outfit that was uh, trying to start a lottery in Fort Worth. So Biffle is now, we can see that he's uh, also a friend to the intelligence forces within uh, within the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Uh, he uh, th He's not listed just as a source. He's specifically listed as an informant. Um, now, I mentioned to you in passing that he was with part of a Dallas Morning News automobile that crashed the motorcade uh, uh, before uh, uh, Kennedy shot. Now, the limo is car number four in the motorcade. Biffle's in what became car number 18, if you will. When the shooting occurs, by Biffle's account, he jumps out of the car at the grassy knoll. He looks around there. And then he uh, enters the book depository and gets by the police car in the first minutes. And he gets in at the same moment, curiously, as Tom Alia. Completely by accident, that's the way he tells it. TV reporter for WFAA who brought in his camera. <clears throat> Biffle claimed he gained entry by hiding his press badge and getting inside with the first wave of cops. A Biffle hears Oswald's name mentioned as a suspect while in the building. He hears that that whole conversation you may be familiar with between Truly and uh, Lumpkin and uh, uh, Fritz. And uh, but he doesn't connect Oswald's name with the Oswald he knew until he got home. I don't believe that for 10 seconds. He'd written several stories about Oswald. In fact, he wrote a story about uh, uh, Oswald. It's dated November 2nd, 1963, 20 days before the assassination. And the story has a very interesting title. It says that uh, Turncoat's mother has never met his wife. Well, and that wasn't true because by all accounts, everyone's account, uh, Oswald and Marina moved in with Marguerite for about a month right after he got back from the Soviet Union. But but more to the point, where's this article? The article uh, is listed in an FBI memo as being written on the 2nd of November, 1963. And it's disappeared. I think the reason it disappeared is either because it's just a total mistake and somebody made it up and uh, it, uh, or got it really, really wrong. Uh, but we've gone through all the newspapers with the uh, archive. The archivists simply can't find the November 2nd, 1963 copy at all. We're still looking for a copy. Uh, but I, I don't know that we ever will. The whole issue of that Fort Worth press just seems to be gone. So that's very strange. But now uh, what else is strange is that he didn't write about his entry into the building. Uh, the cops knew that Allier was filming. They didn't kick him out. And it, 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 he's, uh, he films the actual finding of the rifle. And uh, yet, uh, you know, he, he is allowed to stay in there. And uh, uh, Biffle is apparently allowed to stay too. And they're in there for more than an hour. Uh, and, uh, but he doesn't write about it. Why doesn't he write about it? Uh, there's something really wrong with not ha telling your story about the exclusive. This is an incredible exclusive. He doesn't write about it for many years after. But uh, he does talk to the cops. And uh, he uh, supposedly uh, claimed, uh, well, he claimed later on, that he supposedly saw two roll calls. And he says that at the second roll call, everyone was there but us. The second call supposedly happened at 2.30 p.m. when Oswald was already in custody. Um, and uh, if you want to see his story, it's uh, reporter recalls the day Camelot died in Dallas. And that's like April 5th, 1981, Dallas Morning News. You could put, find that if you go through the Dallas Morning News. Uh, and Mark Bridger, who I know is a friend of uh, Delhi Plaza, UK. My dog is back. I gotta get it. To stop. stop it, you! He does listen to me. <laughs>
Stop it. <laughs> so anyway, he, Mark has written about the myth of the ro depository roll call. And uh, it's very strange. Uh, he wrote on November 28th uh, a very detailed memo about this case. Uh, I, I should call it an article, but it reads like a memo. And it's kind of like the prototype of the uh, Warren Commission report. Uh, and it's six days after this whole thing was done. So the role of Biffle is very strange. Biffle is also one of the few people who claims he saw the paper back, which I find incredible. Uh, almost none of the cops backed up their own officers saying we saw the paper back. It supposedly held the rifle. Um, so it's a very strange series of events with Kent Biffle. And uh, I've, I've done a lot of research on it, and there's more to be done. But uh, the bottom line with Biffle is he, he simply doesn't report on the things that any reporter would be reporting. And he has complete memory loss as to his earlier work with Oswald. He doesn't report on that for years. Um, well, after all the work. So that's the Kent Biffle piece of the saga. And uh, so I can take some questions now. And I don't know how much more time you want uh, me to uh, carry on about Mr. Oswald, but uh, I've got other thoughts on the subject. That's great, Bill. No, we, we want to hear them. There's a couple of things, Bill. Before I bring you in, Johnny, um, there's a. Did you mention earlier on, Bill, in the uh, in your presentation, something about Oswald's stepmother, or did we mishear that? Uh, stepfather was probably what I was trying. Oh, to stepfather. Oh, oh yeah. yes, because you mentioned. Yes, I remember you mentioned. He was the that. electronics guy who I think yeah. passed on his trade. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, Johnny, do you want to come in? I know you've got a question for for Bill. Yeah. Bill, as an attorney, see that you were uh, representing Lee Harvey Oswald, had he not been murdered uh, by Jack Ruby. How would you have gone about, um, how would you approach um, Commission Exhibit CE399? And how important is that to get an Oswald, um, his name cleared, should I say? You know, uh, uh, the 399 gets a big role in the new documentary, I'm happy to say. Uh, and uh, 399, I, I think, has to be part and parcel. I, I wrote a story, I think, Johnny, you, I sent it to you some time ago, Yeah. Uh, about how the Warren Commission basically framed Oswald by ignoring the most important evidence that uh, cleared him and instead tried to use it as dispositive evidence to... Uh, you know, inculpate him. And uh, so I, I, I boiled it down to about 10 key pieces of evidence, and that's one of them. Uh, the, the, you know, the problem with this case, like any other murder case, is there's usually not one evidence that will exonerate somebody. You've got to look at all 10 or more. And it's a lengthy process, and it's exhausting. And because of that, <laughs> hey, because of that, uh, it, it's really easy to. Uh, they asked. They asked an attorney recently, uh, what, "What do you think evidence is? How, you know, and evidence is whatever I can can use to convince the uh, jury to do what I want." And that's a very cynical approach to evidence because evidence really isn't that. That's persuasion or, or propaganda, if you will, not evidence. But that's the problem, too. Uh, you've got uh, like 10 different pieces of evidence. You've got to look at you know each one carefully. And then you've got to persuade people as to the power of your point of view. So for that reason, I don't think 399 is ever going to be dispositive in this case. You know, people, you know, uh, even describe seeing the new film. And this one guy goes, I got this incredible thrill. I got the free song. You know, when I saw the evidence, you know, and uh, and he goes, but at the end, I still believe that, you know, Oliver Stone's just trying to pull the wool over my head. You know, yeah. and because it's a bigger question, 
than just evidence. It's a question of belief systems. Do you think, um, so how damaging then, for example, would it be if OP Wright took the stand and, and uh, publicly rejected Commission Exhibit 399? If, if, which, if which individual took the stand? Right, OP Wright, the man who rejected it. OP talk- Wright is a great witness, as uh, Johnny knows, because he was a former police officer with the Dallas police. He knew uh, weapons and he knew that it looked like a 3030 and not a, a man liquor type bullet. So I think OP Wright would have been a great witness. Yeah. Thanks, Bill. All right. Um, yeah. Go ahead, so, Bill. Well, we've talked about the defector subject at some length. And, uh, you know, I've got several other bits of Oswald uh, research that you might be interested in. But uh, I, I was thinking, I was thinking about discussing in particular something new that I had found out about in particular a uh, woman who was uh, Alan Dulles's mistress, Harry Bancroft. Mm. And uh, specifically what I'm thinking about Mary is uh, some new documents that came to my attention. And uh, what it is, is uh, this. Uh, I know, I'm sure you all are pretty familiar with the Paines, uh, Ruth and uh, Michael Payne. And uh, you may not, uh, I've got this in uh, chapter seven of the, my uh, new edition of the 12 who built the Oswald legend. And uh, what I noticed in that uh, research that I've been doing is that There was about, uh, right during the second week of 1959, uh, the Paines moved from Pennsylvania to uh, Oswald's mother's community in Irving, Texas, during the second week of September 1959. The the very week that Oswald abruptly left his mother he said he was going to come and take care of her. He stayed for the weekend and then went off to defect in the USSR. Uh, now, why had the Paines made the move? Ostensibly, they had made the move so that Michael could take a job with the military contractor, Bell Helicopter. Michael said that Bell had manufactured 40% of all the aircraft used in the Vietnam War. Bell Helicopter was begun and run by Michael's stepfather, Arthur Young, the most recent husband of Michael's mother, Ruth Forbes Payne. Now, uh, I think that the Paynes had a handler within the intelligence community in 1959, whether they knew it or not. Based on their background with the World Federalists and Ruth's work with the Quakers and the Soviet American Friendship Committees, I think Cord Meyer, who was the head of covert action uh, in that era, was uh, a, a logical candidate. Uh, and uh, I also think that the pains were kind of manipulated throughout their lives. I don't think that they were very, now we got somebody at the door. I, I, I got it. Thank you. Uh, uh, now I think that the pains uh, were, were kind of manipulated more than most people realize. Uh, And and I think the most likely way is the simplest and most direct route. Uh, Michael Payne's family also had access to talent in the intelligence arena. Uh, Michael's parents, Ruth Forbes and Lyman Payne, uh, had a close friend named Mary Bancroft. Bancroft was an OSS spy that had a long-term relationship with Alan Dulles. Uh, Bancroft was the granddaughter of a fellow named Clarence Barron, who was the owner of the Dow Jones, you know, industrial stocks company, the manager of the Wall Street Journal, and the founder of Barron's Magazine. So Bancroft is extremely well connected. 
Bancroft discusses Michael's parents at length in her book, Autobiography of a Spy. And she remained close with Ruth Forbes after she, she divorced Lyman Bay and married Arthur Young in 1948. So here's what I'm building up to. In the days after the assassination, Dulles provided a memo on the 2nd of December, 1963, and the Warren Commission. And it was, quote, from a friend. And it described the inner workings of the Payne family. It's very informative, very informative. Uh, uh, the, the letter is particularly important because the FBI is under intense scrutiny for failing to add Oswald to the security index. And they had Michael's father, Lyman, on the security index. He was a Trotskyist activist, uh, his birth father was. And this set off all kinds of alarm bells at the FBI. So the pains were in hot water at the FBI until this letter came. If the FBI had taken a hard look at the pains, they would have re realized that the pains were intelligence driven babysitters for the Oswalds, whether Ruth or Michael realized it or not. The, the, the letter writer provides her own, it, it's pretty clear it's written by a woman from the tone, uh, her own evaluation of Lyman Payne, who I also knew well in the 1920s. He couldn't do anything, he was thoroughly incompetent. However, he sure could talk. And he's and the writer says that Lyman and his new wife, Michael's mother, were active in Trotskyite circles, not real Trotskyites, but belonged to some infinitesimal splinter group. As far as I know, did nothing but sit around and talk talk about how the tr other Trotskyists were betraying the revolution as conceived by Trotsky. Now Bancroft had more than a more than a passing interest in Trotsky. During one of her trysts with Alan Dulles, Dulles had put his hand over her mouth when a visitor came knocking at the door. And Dulles told her that the visitor was, in fact, Leon Trotsky himself. And this isn't during their Switzerland days, trying to provide Dulles with some extremely important and valuable information. And the letter writer refers to Ruth Forbes in the third person. I had also heard, let me get it but not from his mother, that Michael had homosexual tendencies, although he did marry and have children. Who else was also intimately familiar with Lyman, his Trotskyist beliefs, and the nature of Trotskyist splinter groups? Like the letter writer, Bancroft probably didn't see Michael after the divorce between Lyman and Ruth back in 1934. Um, so this is characteristic of the relationship between Dulles and Bancroft. Uh, Bancroft was in an unhappy marriage and she was very attracted to Dulles in the culture of espionage. Um, Dulles made a proposal to her, we can let the work cover the romance, and the romance cover the work. Uh, later on, she made a, the writer made a point of providing a clipped resume of Ruth Forbes' third husband, Arthur Young, uh, the inventor of the Bell helicopter. He knew, she knew about his work, she knew it was extremely complicated and esoteric, and that he had worked for the Institute of, for Advanced Studies at Princeton, and also with Bell Laboratories. Bancroft, a veteran spy, and Ruth Forbes, his close friend, was probably the mysterious author of this memo. He gave it to Dulles, who gave it to Jim Angleton, who gave it to FBI liaison Sam Papich. None of them ever disclosed the letter writer's name. You can now see the letter. Uh, it's chapter. It's in chapter seven of my book, and I think uh, there's a great argument to be made that uh, both both of the pains and the Morinchel were basically co-opted into the world of intelligence. And the main question is whether they're witting or unwitting. My thinking about the pains has always been that they were asked by somebody, somebody like Mary to keep an eye on the Oswalds. I don't think it was ever a lot more complicated than that. And I walk through all the biggest stuff about the pains in my book. I find the pains completely fascinating. But uh, I do feel, you know, Ruth Payne in particular thought she was the smartest person on the block. And Michael Payne, I think, would, uh, was 
willing to do little favors uh, for the FBI, like, you know, pose as, a, you know, an academic in a coffee house, chat with local students about Cuba, and uh, offer a little tidbit. But I think it was all rather informal. And I think it was done through an agent named Bart Odom. And uh, that's basically where I, I wanted to kind of conclude with a little discussion about Bart Odom and uh, uh, the pains, because uh, I think it goes so much to the continuing story of this case and how much more can be learned uh, in terms of uh, putting a bow on uh, the nature of the Oswald relationship, why it's so absurd to think that he was anything more than a bit player in this drama. But again, uh, I'm at your mercy in terms of time. You all tell me which. Um, I will. I will. I mean, what do people think? I'm happy for you to can you know. Continue. Another 15 minutes. I think I can uh, wrap it up if there's yeah. no question. How's yeah, that? that's that's absolutely perfect. Great. I hate to go on for too long because I I don't think anybody could listen to anybody talk for more than 20 minutes. No, it's been great. It's been great. I mean, usually we go for around about an hour and you've gone on a little bit longer than that, which is terrific. So no, it's it's fine, Bill. All righty. So uh, I'm going to turn now to the epilogue of my book. Uh, I, I could be talking about State Secret, which is my favorite, but this is kind of the backstory to State Secret. It's kind of explains why I think Oswald was impersonated in uh, Mexico City. And I couldn't come to that conclusion until I had an idea who Oswald was. So uh, let me kind of put a bow on it. Um, look, I'm thinking about the right place to tell this. Here we go. All right. Um, we have a website in uh, my part of the world called Capitol Hill Blue. It's really good. It's about, you know, uh, it's well regarded. It's kind of the underside of what's going on in the Capitol. The webmaster is a guy named Doug Thompson. And Doug uh, felt that uh, Doug had a dinner with John Connolly in 1982. And uh, at the end of dinner, the, uh, he asked him the $64 question. Uh, Connolly said, you know, I was one of the ones who advised Kennedy to stay away from Texas. Lyndon was being a real asshole about the whole thing and insisted. And Thompson then asked Connolly if he thought Oswald was the shooter. And this to me, I think, it really, I just read this a few months ago, it just completely blew me away. Uh, and you got to trust Doug Thompson, and I do. Connolly turned to him and said, absolutely not. I, you know, I do not for one second believe the conclusions of the Warren Commission. And it, 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 he was, this is in response to the question whether he thought Oswald was the shooter. And, the, and then he asked the next question, why didn't Connolly speak out? Connolly said, because I love this country and we needed closure at the time. I will never speak out publicly about what I believe. Uh, that really gave me chills, but it also made a lot of sense. Um, Mel, his wife, Nellie, who was in the car, uh, she wrote in her book that Connolly personally signed the documents that gave Oswald that undesirable discharge. So that's corroboration from what the legal attache said, which is that they had a half hour conversation and decided not to do anything, just leave the Oswald story uh, undesirable discharge as is. So in my opinion, uh, there was a little memo that Oswald wrote uh, to Hostie that you all may be familiar with. And I think that letter and the letter that was went, went out uh, from Ruth Payne's typewriter uh, in November 63, both of these letters indicate that he was motivated to be seen as a player in the world of espionage. This was his best shot for getting his GI Bill benefits as soon as possible. And it's curious that when you look at his room on Beckley Street, uh, as they did in you know, November 22nd, all three of his key undesirable discharge rulings from 60 to 63 uh, were found together in the few possessions in that tiny room. 
And I don't think him taking a pot shot at Connolly or JFK from the highly insecure sixth floor was a good way for him to get his discharge upgraded. Best way for him to get his discharge upgraded was to get himself seen as an important player in the world of espionage. He could figure out his place in the scheme of things. I think those two letters were two halting steps in that direction. I also think Oswald was involved in doing some favors for someone in those tense behind the scenes atmosphere on November 22nd. Why was he lurking around the first floor except to do a job? I think he was keeping his eye on Joe Molina. Joe Molina had been followed by the communists for eight years, they'd been trying to recruit him. And then two months before the assassination, the lead communist in Dallas, a guy named Bill Lowry, uh, came out as an FBI informant after all those years. This is first shot. Thank you. And so, so uh, I think Oswald was being groomed to be the new, uh, new uh, contact for Joe Molina. Uh, and Molina didn't know that. Uh, this fellow was a communist, and he didn't know that he was an FBI informant, but uh, the FBI knew both those things. That's how they keep tabs on you. I think Oswald was tailing Joe Molina, and if you're a prayer man person like some people are, I got to say that, you know, Joe Molina's on the steps, and the alleged prayer man's standing right behind him. Whether or not that's Oswald, Oswald is about the only person who's not watching the motorcade ostensibly or not fighting to get in the best position. And yet he's probably the most interested person in Dallas about politics. So there's something really going on here. And uh, the, the legal attache made a great quote, uh, the, the one who talked to Connolly that day. He goes, I recommended that he refer the letter to the Commandant of the Marine Corps for appropriate action. And this meant that the secretary was washing his hands of the case. Man, and could do it as he wanted. It was a kiss off. And sure enough, uh, the Foreign Commission has a memo uh, three days uh, after uh, Connolly uh, supposedly forwarded Oswald's letter to Fred Korth. At a time, he's clearing out his desk for Korth. And uh, it's the, the checkoff sheet right there in the routing slip, right there in the Warren Commission report. Uh, states the Oswald letter is being routed for appropriate action. And it's particularly funny because when you look at the Jim Hosty letter story, you know, the Hosty secretary says, oh, Oswald was trying to bomb the place. Uh, Hosty goes, well, actually, I just uh, was told by Oswald that he was going to take appropriate action if uh, he didn't, if uh, I didn't uh, stop tailing his wife. I'm actually kind of inclined to believe Hosty on that piece of it. It might have been a little bit flashier, but this, this whole appropriate action business fails the whole Connolly Oswald story. Uh, and uh, so, so let me turn now to the uh, evidence against Oswald, which Johnny has done uh, such a good job in looking at. Uh, you know, uh, not only is it weird that Oswald is not uh, first in line to look at the motorcade, but if anybody's shooting from the book depository, why would you be, uh, you know, using a highly insecure location to try to get off an accurate shot? And why would you fire from long distance unless, for that matter, unless your goal is to get away? The goal of any book depository shooter, in my opinion, is most probably to cause a provocation. Maybe get off a shot, but you're not going to get off a good shot and get away. I mean, that's why I think the military did this hit, because you need the best people in the world to do that. And they're not the CIA, and they're not Lee Harvey Oswald. I'm not saying the CIA didn't play a role, but I think the shooters are military. I don't think they're mafia either. These are the best in the world. Best in the world. Uh, if there was a plan... Oswald could have been positioning himself in any way, a number of ways, uh, with or without his uh, witty knowledge that there was going to be a shot at the president, but he was being positioned to take the fall. I think the relationships between the Paines, the and Shelt, the Paines and Oswald, and the and Shelt and Oswald are all tied to Alan Dulles. Uh, that 
party in Texas where they the Paines and Borenchelt and Oswald all met, surrounded by oil-affiliated people with ties to Radio Free Europe and the Dulles Wing of the CIA, February 63. That's what's telling uh, in terms of the handoff. Not necessarily that he's, you know, that he's going to be shooting anybody, but that he's a vulnerable being. Dulles liked working with Unitarians and Quakers. These groups are filled with people interested in left-wing movements, as well as people who wanted to bring the communists down. I also believe the pains were being closely observed by the white Russians in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, who knew that anti-Soviet NTS intelligence operatives and similar forces were all around. As Dorothy, as Ruth Tudor, Ruth Payne had a tutor named Dorothy Gravitas. She was active with these kind of. He told War, the Warren Commission, "I said to Mrs. Payne to be more careful." And then I've got a whole uh, flow chart in my book that shows the relationship between the CIA and the anti-Soviet, what I would even call it, the fascist NTS, that was trying to overthrow the Soviet Union. In fact, you know, by 91, the Soviet Union was overthrown, and it was because of groups like them and others inside the Soviet Union, as well as the CIA. Uh, the Paines were very much at home with Dorothy Kravitz. Her son-in-law, Ilya Mamanov, and her son-in-law was recruited by the Army Intelligence to assist the FBI in interrogating Marina on November 22nd and getting her to give and, mis and misquoting her about the rifle and all that and other displaced persons in the white Russian community. Because of Ruth's attraction to the Russian language and because of their shared anti-communist values. The CIA had an office in Dallas run by Jim Moore, who was the college roommate of FBI agent Wallace Heitman. Heitman spoke Spanish. His uh, partner, Anatol Bogoslav, were the FBI's top Russian translator. So Heitman was Spanish. Bogoslav was Russian. There were great assets in working with the white Russians in Dallas who harbored this powerful NTS network. Heitman interviewed Marina Oswald literally dozens of times in the weeks after November 22nd, kept at it till late 64. Can you imagine how exhausted Marina must have been, willing to say anything to avoid getting deported or worse? And when they pulled Bill Lowry, the guy who was following Joe Molina all those years, and they wanted to question him about that. Heitman steps in as his lawyer. This is 15 years after the assassination and told Lowry to shut up. And we, and we got very little of the story, thanks to Heitman. And Heitman had a close colleague who's even more interesting if possible, uh, Birdwell Odom. Odom was a native Texan. His brother Arthur was vice consul to the Venezuelan consul during 1963. Heitman specialized in working with the Russians and the Cubans as a valued CIA liaison in the Dallas office. But Odom was a senior criminal specialist, and he was a favorite of the Dallas FBI chief, or in Shanklin. Heitman was the guy who met Eldon Rudd. Well, I'm going to skip the Eldon Rudd story for a moment. That's more about Heitman. It's very interesting. You all can read it if you like. I want to focus on Odom. Odom was a veteran in the world of intelligence. Uh, as discussed in the book, Michael Payne said he knew him as Bob Odom before the assassination. The Irving Barber, Cliff Shastine, who became mayor of Irving after the assassination, he regularly gave haircuts to both Oswald and Odom before the assassination. Odom spent many years in contact with Ruth Payne after the assassination. I believe that Odom was the FBI man who handled the Payne's both before and after the assassination, whether they knew it or not. Odom told Ruth he'd left a note for the agents in the FBI office. FBI, uh, Ruth told the Warren Commission she believed it until after she learned uh, after the assassination, it was another lie by Oswald. But then in 75, the Oswald note to Hosty was finally re revealed to be true. Most of the agents admitted they knew the story, but not Odom. Odom claimed to Ruth he had never known about the Oswald visit to the Dallas FBI office, just even though everybody else did. When Ruth found out that Oswald actually delivered the post note to Hosty, he blurted out Odom's name to the media as her source. 
and it just it coughed it up in 1975. And then she called up Odom and apologized, saying, it's all my fault. I, I blew it. Ruth referred to Odom as her primary contact. The relationship between Osteen and Odom is also fascinating. To hear Osteen tell the story in his book, Odom knew all about how Hosty was ordered to destroy the note Oswald brought to the FBI office. Uh, this, uh, and, but Odom denies every word of Hosty's account, saying if any FBI agent was involved in destroying evidence, he would not forget it. But Odom had a lot to forget about. He, he was busy on November 22nd and afterwards. Martha Moyer and Raymond Gallagher wrote articles that schooled me over the years about Mr. Odom's busy schedule. Leslie Sharp, who has a new book coming out on this whole era, uh, uh, part of the whole Al Borelli uh, school. Uh, but Leslie knew I was hot on Odom's trail, and she reminded me just how busy he was in the first moments after JFK was shot. We first see Odom driving J.C. Day from the book depository to put the assassination rifle, alleged assassination rifle into a locked evidence box that Days uh, had it on the fourth floor of the police department. He calls in on with the FBI radio channel, that, that, and we don't have that info at all. All that radio traffic on the FBI is gone. We then see Odom stationing himself as a guard in the lobby of the Texas theater, watching Oswald B. Frog marched away. Uh, curiously, Odom standing right inside the theater near FBI Officer Robert Barrett, who's got a lot of problems of his own on this case, and Dallas Captain Picky Westbrook, who's got a lot of problems of his own. Like Odom, Barrett's also told his own share of whoppers. Barrett told a variety of stories about whether or not he was looking for bullets with Buddy Walters in Daly Plaza in the moments after the assassination. Similarly, when Westbrook was videotaped holding a wallet similar to Oswald's, Barrett told Westbrook the wallet had both Oswald and Hiddell's ID in it. On other occasions, Barrett falsely told the news media that a card with O.H. Lee on it was found in the wallet. The lies of Odom and Barrett were designed to confuse everyone about the key at, at events surrounding the assassination. And in fact, that's going to be the next book I write. It's going to be basically about the false evidence that has been sewn into this case over the years to keep us confused. Uh, by 151, the radio transcript shows that Jerry Hill and his colleagues are en route to headquarters with Oswald. Hill was with Luke Mooney on the sixth floor when they claimed to find the Malacher Halls that matched the rifle that Odom escorted to the evidence room. Odom is busy. Uh, those halls, uh, I think, were not necessarily planted there at all. I, I mean, were probably planted. Uh, and, and that's another discussion, which you can read in another article. Uh, then Odom shows up, uh, searches of Ruth Payne's home and finds all, helps find all the great evidence, like the ring story. I get into that. I'm going to skip all that now. Uh, but what I want to focus on is just how much Ruth and Michael regularly spoke with Odom. Uh, they, they spoke with her over and over again, uh, him over and over again. But Marina did not. Marina told Odom she would not talk to the FBI right away. That got her nothing but relentless scrutiny. Uh, and uh, I've got a photo of Marina talking to Odom while holding the baby, saying, you know, I just can't really carry on here. But the 23rd of November is also the day that Ruth gives Oswald's uh, draft letter, the one that didn't actually get in the mailbox the draft. He gave it to Jim Hosty after holding it back from the Dallas police on the day of the assassination. To me, this is the clearest example that the Paynes knew they were enmeshed with a relationship with the federal government due to the nature of their relationship with the Oswald family. Any other person other than Ruth Payne would have provided the Oswald draft letter to the Dallas police right on the spot. On the 24th, Odom interviewed Ruth and obtained her copy of the Oswald draft letter. Hosty said Odom was sent by their boss to verify Hosty's story and to make sure Hosty hadn't mistreated 
Ruth and Marina and his interviews before the assassination. Odom, on his part, went on to sign an affidavit saying, I don't recall the story. And then Odom got caught up in a number of other controversies, like the Minox camera. Uh, Wally Heitman got a hold of the chain of custody list and changed the p police listing of the Minox camera to a Minox light meter. And so then it became a major issue. And so then Michael Penn comes forward to Odom and says, oh, the Minox found in Ruth's home was my camera. And uh, so uh, that's how they tried to cover up the Minox story. And uh, there's more about it you can read, but he's caught up in the Minox yarn and he's also caught up in the 399 story. Um, the, there's a 1964 memo that summarizes a series of interviews with witnesses. And it says that O.P. Wright, who we've talked about, uh, he was security at Parkland, he was a former police officer. And Daniel Tomlinson, uh, uh, this memo says the, that 399 appeared to be the same bullet they'd seen on November 22nd. Of course, that's not what Tomlinson said, it's not what Wright said. This memo tells a lie. And that, so, uh, you know, Wright had said, look, this bullet has a pointed tip like a 3030. It does not have a rounded tip like 399 you see in the archives. So many years later, 2002, Tink Thompson, Gary Aguilar seek out Odom and interview him. And he goes, oh, this memo is mistaken. I never had possession of the magic bullet. This memo, he said, if I conducted such interviews with Wright and Tomlinson, uh, I'd write up my own memo recounting these interviews. Well, he says, you know, I, I just don't know how this happened. Uh, I, and uh, Tink tried to give Odom a pass and say, well, maybe these documents have just been withheld. I'm like, no, I think Odom made it up. I don't think it ever happened. So, uh, that's a bit of the Odom story. And the, uh, is there anything else I really want to share? There's one last story I wanted to share. Uh, and this is about uh, Michael Payne. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this, but there's a really fascinating story uh, that uh, comes out uh, that a third party reports that Michael Payne said to Ruth over the phone that Lee killed Oswald, but we both know who is responsible. And there's been a long story that this story came from wiretap. I don't think it's true. I think again, this story was entirely made up by an intelligence officer. This operative who either was a telephone repairman or gave the story to a repairman, but passed on this planted story to Irving police chief, Paul Barger with the hope of linking Oswald to the communist menace and instigating an attack on Cuba. Uh, when LBJ made it clear to uh, uh, the DA that any rumors about communist involvement had to be squelched, I think efforts were made after that to bury this report. Uh, Ruth initially denied such a statement was made. By her. And uh, by the seventies, she was going, well, the initial conversation referred to American right-wing forces that were coding, creating a hostile environment prior to my death. And, and Hosty says, well, the phone call happened and it was between Lyman Payne and his son, Michael. And they didn't take it too seriously. They figured Lyman was talking about how people killed Trotsky. And, you know, and then there's another story that Barger says it was between Ruth's phone and Michael's phone overheard by a telephone repairman. But there's a phone log for Ruth's call showing a November 22nd. And there's no phone call log for November 23rd between these two particular numbers. Um, uh, so it just doesn't stand up. Uh, Barger says, well, maybe it was the call was the 22nd rather than the 23rd. Well, the only thing that's shown is the 22nd call, not the 23rd call. So it's it, again, it gets more and more confused. And I think I think I spent hours and hours and days and days and weeks and weeks trying to untangle the story. Uh, and, and without uh, giving you all the details, let me get to the highlights. 
Um, this FBI agent re, uh, interviewed the Irving police chief. He goes, and the Irving police chief goes, look, I got info. The male voice was heard in a conversation during a phone call heard on November 23rd. Uh, male voice was said to comment. He felt sure Oswald killed the president. Doesn't feel Oswald was responsible. And further stated, we both know who's responsible. We hear this voice, we hear this language rather verbatim in another report later on, but instead of naming Paul Berger, it names confidential informant. So then they, uh, you know, Ainsworth of all people interviews Berger many years later. And Berger says it was a telephone repairman who was checking out the line. Um, Berger's still alive. I'd still like to get a statement from him. I'm working on it. But what I find fascinating is that when the FBI examined the records, Michael's office number, it was initially described as an unpublished number for Bell Helicopter. And that's odd because if M Michael worked in Arlington, 10 miles away from this unpublished number, and was one of the few employees with a key to the lab. So the story just keeps getting stranger and stranger. And this is what I think kind of ties it together. A different FBI agent gets a different story in December. It says this number is for the Arlington, where Michael actually worked. Mike Payne and George Johnson, another employee, give access to the plant to telephone company employees. To me, this indicates that Mike Payne had been assigned by Bell Helicopter to be its liaison to the telephone company. And that the operatives at the phone company had a personal relationship with Payne. This may have been who was supposedly listening into the phone call between Mike Payne and Ruth. Telephone company operatives have a close knit relationship with intelligence operatives. That's how you set up wired that, right? I believe that the Paynes told someone, maybe Mike's mother, maybe Mary Bancroft herself, they'd keep an eye on the Oswald. And I believe they got in way over their head. Furthermore, I think the whole story that the Paynes knew who was responsible was made up and was part of a plan to point the assassination on Castro Cuba. This story was a spare part, you know, just like the John Connolly story, linking Oswald to a larger plot, but in the end was not used. Uh, shortly after the assassination, you know, remember how LBJ's people just settled on the story Oswald acted alone? How LBJ made it clear to his friend Richard Russell in November 29th, we got to take this out of the arena where they're testifying that Khrushchev and Castro did this and that and kick us into a war that could kill 40 million Americans in an hour. Uh, there's a lot of national security concerns. Good reason on uh, the, that period of time. And I think that's what led us into the package we have to try to unravel. So those are my thoughts. Any questions? Thanks a lot, uh, Bill. Um, there is a question from Johnny. I can bring you in now, Johnny, if you have one. <laughs> it's me again, Bill. Um, I'm going to ask you to speculate for, for just a moment. Um, we all know about the, story, the, the testimony of Lee Bowers. And we know that he observed two individuals behind the, the, the wooden fence during the time of the assassination. Can you think of any innocent explanation why these two individuals have never came forward in 57, 58 years? Which individuals get Lee Bowers and who else? Well, yeah, Lee Bowers testified. Well, and Lee Bowers told Mark Lane and he testified that he's seen two individuals behind the wooden fence during the assassination. Can you think of any innocent explanation why these two men uh, who are behind the wooden fence uh, have never came forward in 57, 58 years? No, no. I think the Bowers testimony is some of the best out there in terms of what really happened. Uh, I, I, you know, if, if you, there was an innocent explanation, uh, you'd think they'd want to provide it. But on the other hand, a lot of innocent people haven't come forward because they don't want the notoriety. So you can always make up an excuse for them. Uh, so I, that wouldn't be my biggest problem. My biggest problem is that I think the Lee Bowers testimony, like you do, is some of the best that's out there. It has the advantage of being corroborated by numbers of other witnesses. 
mm. many, you know, the, the accounts, if you look at the Stuart Gallinor database, Mary Farrell, you'll see the consensus was just about split between the grassy knoll and the book deposit. And I think, in fact, those are probably the only two places where you could hear shots. There was probably at least one place where somebody used a silent mm. uh, more. So, it, you know, it was a, it was a, it was a long range assassination. The only one we've really had in American history. And to me, you know, it's a perfect, you know, it, if you're trying to get away, don't leave a rifle that's the best documented rifle in Dallas. Mm. <laughs> The whole purpose of a long distance uh, setting is to get away. And uh, I can't think of an innocent uh, explanation for what Bowers said. And the three, the, th the three cars that cruised the parking lot as well. Yeah. One of right. which was a guy was supposedly talking into a mic. Right. There's a lot of drama that's going on there. I, I'm, I'm even a believer in, in, in the umbrella story that there's something really wrong there too, that the umbrella person was some kind of spotter. Uh, I don't like to spend a lot of time in Daily Plaza because uh, it's so controversial. And at the same token, you know, I don't think it's as important as, as other people do. Uh, I kind of line up with Tink Thompson who I've been working with in the last year that you know, once you prove there's more than one gun, you know, that, that's really the most important thing you can do. And that is best done, not by the Lee Bauer story, but I think by the forensic evidence, because forensic evidence uh, you know, is intimately uh, more reliable than eyewitness evidence, which I always am nervous about as an attorney, because eyewitnesses so often get it wrong. Uh, you know, scientists, you know, are among the best witnesses you can ask for, especially when they have evidence that's not tampered with. And I think with the evidence that does exist in this case, the Zapruder film, uh, autopsy photos and the rest, that they provide best evidence that, that there was at least two shooters. Do you think so th that's my bias? Yeah, I've just read Tink's new book, and it's very good. <clears throat> Bill, do you think if Mark Lane was allowed to represent Oswald before the commission, do you think he would have been uh, um, introducing exculpatory evidence, calling his own witnesses, etc.? Well, I, I'm very critical of Mark Lane, I'm, uh, and so uh, uh, I, I would use another attorney for that uh, role. Uh, Mark did some interesting things. I'm going to be writing about Mark in my next book. Uh, I don't think he was a disinformation agent per se, but, I, but he was a publicity seeker and I think it caused real problems in the case. And the reason I say that is because well, besides Kent Piffle, there's this one guy named Thayer Waldo, who was a kind of a left-wing journalist who was writing for the Dallas Morning News. And he got fed a story by Mike Howard uh, of the Secret Service and Pat Howard of the Dallas Police. They were brothers. And the two of them fed him a story saying that Charles Givens saw Oswald shoot in the sixth floor window. He went ahead and published it. And uh, then about uh, uh, two, three weeks later, Mark Lane is shooting the breeze with Thayer Waldo. And Thayer Waldo tells him this story. And he tells him who his sources were. And, and Mark Lane blows his sources and, and prints them in the National Guardian. Now, you know, people could say, well, Mark Lane did that for the greater good, but it destroyed Thayer Waldo's career, you know, uh, oh. because his sources were blown. And what's worse is think about it for a minute. Here's a guy in the Secret Service and a guy with the Dallas police, both telling this incredible bullshit story. Uh, to uh, the Waldo, who then prints it, you know, to a national audience, and uh, you know, and Charles Givens can speak for himself, right? And Charles Givens is scared to death as a result of what happens, and as a result, he's the witness who puts Oswald in the sixth floor, at, you know, at twelve twenty, where nobody else does it. He doesn't say I saw him shooting, but Givens is highly intimidated. This highly intimidated. 
So uh, what Mark, you know, what Mark Lane did, I think was, uh, you know, terrible. But what I think uh, Waldo did was admirable, even though he got the story wrong. And what I think is uh, horrifying is what M the Howard brothers did. And what I'm really struck by in conclusion is Mike Howard's going around to this day, and has been for the last four years, saying that there was a missing page ripped out of Oswald's address book. And it said, I'm going to kill John Connolly. I'm going to kill Jim Hosty. I'm going to kill LBJ. And, and Howard is running around 58 years later, still spreading disinformation, just like he did to Thayer Waldo all those years ago. So I, I, the reason I said Mark Lane was because, of course, Marguerite Oswald asked Mark Lane if she would represent Oswald before the commission. And not Mark Lane right. called well, and, and the reason she did is because Lane had taken this story under his wing and was telling it, you know, it, it, he got himself appointed because of his, you know, big mouth, you know, you know, which is not bad. People, attorneys do that all the time. But I think Mark could have done a far more, far more effective job than he did. And uh, I'm really, really disappointed, Jobby. Let me put it. Uh, I've I've never been a fan of Mark Lane, and it's because he he tells too many whoppers. You know, I mean, he's not Rudy Giuliani, but he's not Clarence Darrow either. He doesn't stick with facts, and it the, hurts all of us when people do that. I think the, the the in my opinion, the best book on the case is Sylvia Mager's Excesses After Fact. I think that uh, I'm sorry, Johnny. What did you say again? I missed it. I think the best book on the case is Sylvia Mager's Successes After the Fact. I think uh, Sylvia Mager sticks to the facts of the case. She doesn't really speculate. Oh, I, I see why I had a problem. We we call her Sylvia Marr. Sylvia Marr. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. yeah I, I think she's probably got the best book on the case, just because it was probably it was such an in-depth analysis of the evidence and the problems with it. Um. Total agreed. You and I are on the Sylvia Mar side of this fence. Absolutely. Yeah. She's the best. Yeah. Oh, Bill, just, oh, sorry, go ahead, Johnny. No, I was, I was just, all I was going to say was, um, it was about the, the paper bag. You, you were touching upon it earlier. <clears throat> what kind of problems would that present? Um, you know, the paper bag wasn't in the, the official crime scene photographs. Wouldn't a, would a defense attorney be questioning that? why it was removed, if it was removed, et cetera? I've said for many years, I think Johnny knows this. I don't think uh, a judge would have let a jury take this case. You know, I think a judge would have thrown it out before it got that far. The evidence is so outrageous about the paper bag. Uh, for no other reason than it's not photographed on the scene. How could you not do that? There's also testimony as well. Uh, who, who was it again? Which I can't remember which FBI. Was it Carrigan? Who, uh, who testified that there is no evidence that the uh, paper bag held the rifle. It, it, there's no oil. There's no nothing to yeah. indicate that the bag held it. And then there's those two FBI memos. One say the bag held the rifle. The other one says the bag did not hold the rifle. How could you be create two FBI records unless you were trying to decide which one to use? Yeah. I think it's, it's very interesting. I think it's... Um, the, the paper bag that never was. That's uh, an article by Ian. Ian. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. No, he's the man on it. He's the one who really educated this one. That's think, how important that evidence is. I think in, in that article, it states if there is no gun sack, there is no gun. And I think that's how simple it gets. It's a, cre it's a crucial piece of the case. And, you know, when you put those 10 and more pieces of evidence together, you know, uh, you, you know, you wind up with the opposite of what David Bellin said. David Bellin took 10 items of evidence and said, this is the proof that Oswald's a guilty party. And uh, my article, which is, you know, basically called How the Warren Commission Framed Oswald, says you look at those 10 pieces of evidence closely and all, all 10 of those evidentiary items you know, point more towards exoneration than anything else. Have you seen what Joe Tonehill said about, um, he was asked the question, Joe Tonehill was a commission counsel for Ruby, I think. Yes. He, he was asked in an interview, uh, what's his opinion as to how a trial for Oswald would have, what would have been the outcome? And Tonehill says that he thinks that um, it was a weak circumstantial evidence case, and he thinks the judge would have been forced to instruct the jury 
to come back with a verdict of not guilty based on insufficient evidence. That's what he says. Yeah, that, that's a very fair reading of the evidence. You know, you, uh, you, you had a rifle up there. Anybody who found that rifle in the first minutes would have found that it had been recently fired. You know, just by feeling. And uh, it, there's so many things that are wrong with the evidence here. Just astounding. I was never a, bel a true believer that Oswald was probably innocent of firing a gun until 2015 when I, you know, when I took a, my hardest look at the evidence and I came away saying, this case is even weaker than I thought. Do you think the, da do you think the Dallas police, uh, do you think the Oswald's family could bring any kind of um, litigation towards the Dallas police for wrongful death? No. I Honestly, I don't think wrongful death would fly uh, at this late date. You know, I think back then she could have done it, and she did. You she know? did. Oh, she didn't. Uh, right, okay. No, she did. She never brought a wrongful death case against the Dallas police. She should have. Yeah. We'd know a lot more about the death of Oswald if we did. And you know, I, I've uh, it, my next book is also going to talk about George Butler and my analysis about why I think Butler was probably one of the main movers of the Oswald hit. And it's not original to me. Jan uh, Stevens and other researchers did this research long. Um, Bill, I've just got a couple of quick questions before we wrap up. Thanks for that, Johnny. Um, yes. Just a quick one. Um, there's a question from Joseph just about um, Howard, uh, Mike Howard's brother who worked at the Dallas Morning News. Um, what was his first name? Oh, oh, we're talking about Howard? Howard, yeah, Mike Howard's brother. Mike Howard's brother. He worked for the Dallas police. His name was Patrick. 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 Thanks a lot, Bill. Yep. Is that okay, yeah. Joseph? Cool. Uh, Tim, you've got your hand up. Um, if I'll take this question, and then we can think about, um, about, about wrapping up. Go ahead, Tim. This is a question. In part five, I think it is, of your 12 who built the Oswald legend, you talk about the various dis discrepancies between weight and height that, um, regarding Oswald, and you suggest, I think, that the idea was to confuse or conflate Webster with Oswald. So first question is, is that is my understanding of what you're saying correct? And secondly, why would they want to do that? All right, well, let's look at it this way. I always go back to the minutes after the assassination, where uh, a, a description uh, got called in uh, from uh, uh, Sawyer, who was uh, holding the fort in front of the depository, saying, I just interviewed somebody uh, who said he saw the shooter and he was five foot 10, 165. White guy. Um, pretty nondescript, you know, description. He asks, uh, the, he was asked later, who was the guy? He goes, well, he's a white guy and he was not too tall and not too short. And he's the one who told me about the five foot 10, 165 description. Now, this is a pretty important description. And uh, uh, they never, and this is the, the weirdo description, if you will, of Oswald that's in the, uh, goes all the way from the 50, 1960. FBI memos and CIA memos up till 1963. And uh, where does this description come from? And I'd spent a lot of time thinking about it and I found some handwritten notes in uh, Bob Webster's uh, file that point out the fact that he's five foot 10, 165 pounds. And I'm like, this is really strange. How did Webster's description, which is accurate for Webster and totally inaccurate for Oswald, wind up in Dallas then? And then I find out that uh, the description, in fact, was used sometimes by the CIA and the FBI, not all the time, but some of the time, uh, and supposedly came from Marguerite Oswald, uh, which I don't believe. So th 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 this phony information was introduced at the same time as this. Uh, Lee Henry Oswald yarn. Uh, I think all the, I think these things are not simple mistakes. If they were uh, for no other reason than that, 
the, if the FBI and CIA were interested in solving this case, they'd be trying to figure out where this five foot 10, 165 description came from. Why uh, was it used on November 22nd? Why was it so important? And there's no discussion about it at all in their memo. So something's really wrong. And I think it came from the fact that they decided uh, I, the Oswald Webster uh, fiscal description is hardly this one and the same, but it's close enough, kind of like Lee Oswald and Mike Payne, to make people wonder, to make people think, get tongues wagging. And I think that was the whole purpose in many ways of having Oswald come in right behind Webster was uh, that it got the Soviets to talk and they could uh, learn counterintelligence information from getting them. Uh, that's a bit of a long-winded explanation, but the whole conf congruence between Webster and Oswald is really shocking. You know, they, they tailed each other coming in, they tailed each other going out, shared the same description. Uh, they even had uh, relation. both of them had relationships of some sort with Marina. Marina admitted having talked with uh, Webster while he was in Oh, it all looks like spy games to me. Okay. Thanks Bill, so much for that, Bill. Can I, Bill, can I ask you one more thing? Just very, very yeah. quickly. The shells that were found on the sixth floor, C543, 544, and 545, um, when the police uh, made searches, and I think the police and the FBI actually made a canvas to find out where Oswald allegedly procured the ammunition, and both of the stores said they never sold any ammunition to Oswald. When you couple that up with the fact that when there were searches carried out at Beckley and uh, in Irvine, and they found no, not any evidence at all that Oswald owned any ammunition, um, no ammunition boxes, etc., in his possession, um, how can the prosecution or how could the state say that Oswald was on that left them shells on that uh, on the sixth floor when they can't even prove that he actually owned any ammunition? It, it makes her tough task a lot tougher because you've got to train with a rifle in order to be good at the rifle. This rifle was out of uh, sync. It needed shims. It didn't shoot correctly. And most importantly, like you say, because there's no ammo uh, or signs of ammo. Uh, we have no proof that he was training at all with this rifle. We don't even have proof that it was in his possession in the days prior to November 22nd. All we do know is there's a paper trail that ties him very securely to the rifle. But it doesn't uh, show that he picked it up. It just shows that uh, somebody uh, using his pseudonym ordered it. And there's ordering. We also have exculpatory evidence that Oswald was uh, present at his work when the rifle uh, was ordered on March 12, 1963. We have that. I, I wouldn't take that to the bank as tightly as you might, Johnny, only because, you know, there's just so many wet. There's no, uh, what's what do you call it? He, he didn't have a punch card at work. He could have gone out for an hour and we just don't know him. Yeah, but back in the day, it went by jobs he was working on. So it was like 8 o'clock till 8.25, he was on a certain job. And then it was like 8.25 till 9.30, et cetera, et cetera. So if he was missing from work, then the jobs that were shown to be completed during the various times, someone would have to have completed them if he went missing. And it's, and it's documented that he was at work completing these various jobs while the rifle was ordered. Well, uh, do, is there positive proof that the order was... Uh placed with the post office before noon time yeah that's correct so on the on the envelope it says dallas texas march 12 1963 eh, sorry 63 10 30 a.m yeah well the fact that it offers a time is and you, like you say if the times are verified then it does raise yet another question but that's not the kind of stuff i i don't i've never treated that quite as strongly as you have i mean you know, if he got to eat lunch at noontime and the thing said 1030, you know, that doesn't necessarily spell end of the game for me. But it's one more, I like to call evidence like that one more marble in the jar. When you've got 10 marbles r rattling around, all of which 
support each other, which I think they do in the Oswald rifles. I think then you've got some. But then, you know, and this is the horror, Johnny, about all these murder type cases. You've got all this good evidence, but how do you shake the belief systems of people in the face of the evidence? We can't, in the United States, as you know, uh, you know, our former president has tried, has convinced most of the members of his own party that he actually won the election. Hmm. You know, and I, I've, I've worked on election fraud cases and I think there are cases of election fraud. And this Mr. Trump case is simply not one of them, but you can't convince members of his own party of the contrary. So, I mean, this is the horror of where we find ourselves. It's not enough to have the superior evidence. You've got to have the better story. That's why I love people like Oliver Stone, because they're, because they're good, they're good uh, storytellers, and they're not propagandists, and there's a real difference between yeah, I always find that no matter how much evidence you tell people or show people, they'll always just believe that he was guilty, Oswald. Oh, yeah. Right. He's right. Well, you know, happily, you know, I think we still have the edge in many ways in terms of the public. Uh, the large numbers of members of the public want to believe our side of the story. They don't have access to the evidence we do. We do want to get the evidence to them. And we do want to be able to tell better stories. Which is why I prefer talking 20 minutes at a time. I don't want to bore the audience. And at the end, I think the most important thing all of us can do is think of video ways of telling this story because most people don't read books. Mm -hmm. Yeah, true. Well, it was good speaking to you. Likewise, this is great. Absolutely. It's been terrific, Bill. And you've, you've gone above and beyond. At least it's a decent time of day for you now. And uh, <laughs> you can enjoy the rest of your day. But on behalf of all of us, thank you so, so much for your time today. It's been terrific. Lot thank you. And loop me in. I'd love to join you on future webinars as, oh, a, as a listener. That would absolutely. be great. Thanks a lot, Bill. I really appreciate it. I'm just going to stop the recording. We can still talk. but I'm gonna stop No, we're good. Thanks, guys. I'll take off. Thank, thank you, Bill. You.